Hi everyone, welcome to this lesson where today we're talking about parallel lines and proportional parts. So the first thing that we're going to be taking a look at is the triangle proportionality theorem and then the triangle mid-segment theorem. So first off it says a line parallel to one side of a triangle separates the other two sides proportionally. The converse is also true. So here I have triangle ACE and it looks like I have a line BD that is parallel to one of my sides AE. And when you have that happen, then the side, uh, the parts of the sides are now proportional to each other. So AB over BC is proportional to ED over DC. Okay, so when you have a line parallel to one of the sides of a triangle, that parallel line separates the other two sides into proportional parts. And that's gonna let us then be able to solve for some of these missing sides. So here if I say, okay, well I have four and x, five and five. Well, four over x, so this part over this part of that side of the triangle should be equal to five over five. And in that case, it's obviously very easy to solve. You end up getting x equals four which makes sense because four over four would be equal to five over five. So now if I use that same idea here, three over six would be equal to nine over X, and I end up getting X is equal to 18. Now something else you can of course take a look at, and you, the way you could set it up is I could say four over five is equal to X over five. I could have set this up as three over nine is equal to X, uh, six over X. You can set up proportions in many different ways. You're going to get the same thing. And a lot of these proportions, if the numbers are nice, you're gonna just look for that common multiplier and you can most likely do it without setting up an equation. Here now, when we we're dealing with binomials in our expressions, we just have to be a little extra careful, but the same idea applies. So I would be able to say that X plus six over X is equal to 10 over two. Or I can say x plus 6 over 10 is equal to x over 2, which is the way I wrote this out. So again, there's numerous ways. You could go side to side equals side over side. You could do part 1 over part 2 is equal to part 1 over part 2. Um, either way, you're going to use your cross products to solve this proportion. And in this case, we end up getting a solution of three halves. So solving the equation is no problem. It's just making sure we set this up properly. Same idea here. I could set this up as x plus 2 over x minus 1 equals 18 over 10. Or I could set it up as x plus 2 over 18 is equal to x minus 1 over 10. Use my cross products to solve. And in this case, this problem, we end up getting 4.5. Okay, so now the second thing that we're going to take a look at is the triangle mid-segment theorem. So it says the mid-segment connects the midpoints of two sides. So inside AC, B is the midpoint, and then inside CD, I'm sorry, CE, D is the midpoint. And so the mid-segment is the line that's created that connects the two uh, midpoints. And this mid-segment is parallel to the third side, and it's actually half of the length. So if this length is x, then the entire side length here is 2x. Okay, so the third side is actually double that mid-segment side. Okay, so BD is equal to one-half of AE. So with that being said, if I asked you for the mid-segment, and I give you the line parallel to it, the side parallel to it, the mid-segment's half of that length, so x is 5. If I give you the mid-segment and I ask you to find the third side of the triangle, you would simply double it. So here, if I give you the uh, third side and I ask you to find the mid-segment, the mid-segment is half of that length, so half of 7 is 3.5. And last one, if I give you the mid-segment and I ask you for the third side, you would double it and x would be equal to 12. Now let's take a look at proportional parts with parallel lines. So I have three different ways we could set up 
um, proportions using A, B, C, and D here. And technically, anything I show you, you can also flip. You can reverse your, uh, your statement. There's many, many different ways. But as long as you follow one of these ways, pretty much with all of the problems, then you're going to be good. Me, myself, when I look at problems, sometimes I switch up the different ways that I set things up. And sometimes you have to. Uh, depending on what you're given and what you can solve for. And if you set one uh, something up one way and it just doesn't look right, try setting it up a different way. So proportional parts with parallel lines. So here's the deal. When you have parallel lines, then the segments that are created within the transversals that are broken up by the parallel lines, they are proportional to each other. So whenever you have parallel lines, the segments of A and B Okay, so the ratio of A over B is proportional to C over D. Okay, so A over B is equal to C over D. And of course, when you cross multiply these and you use cross products, you end up getting AD is equal to BC, which I'm going to have you hang on in just a moment and take a look at. Another way you could set up a proportion is you could say, well, I'm going to do side to side. So I'm going to say A over C is equal to b over d. And notice when you, what you get when you do cross products here, you actually get the exact same result. So that just proves to you that either one of those two uh, scenarios is an option. And then the third option is when you take a part and you place it over a whole. So a over the entire length of a plus b. So the little segment over the entire length of the segment a plus b would be equal to the other little segment C over the entire length of C plus D. Now look what happens here when you do cross products. So A times C plus D, and then C times A plus um, B. And when I distribute, I get AC plus AD equals AC plus BC. And look what you're actually left with, AD equals BC. So no matter which way you set up your proportions, they actually all give you the exact same result. So now let's take a look at some problems. So here, again, I could set this up as 10 over X equals 16 over X plus 4. I could also set it up as 10 over 16 is equal to X over X plus 4. I could even set it up as 10 over 10 plus X equals 16 over 16 plus X plus 4. Uh, which is unnecessary in this problem. So here I set it up as part one over part two is equal to part one over part two. I'm going to use my cross products to solve. And again, at this point, it's just very straightforward and simple. Same idea here. I have so many options of ways I could set this up. So 2x plus 6x is equal to 8 over x plus 4. I'm going to use my cross products. Now, this situation, when you multiply x times x, you are going to get that x squared. Um, when you do 2x times x plus 4, you get 2x squared plus 8x. Now, remember, when this happens, you now have a polynomial equation. And step one in solving a polynomial equation is to set the equation equal to 0. So I would have to subtract 48x. Step two in solving a polynomial equation is to factor. Now this is a binomial, so there's only two ways we're gonna factor this binomial. It's either a difference of squares or we factor out a GCF. And here it's definitely not a difference of squares, but we can factor out a GCF. The greatest common factor of 2x squared and 40x is 2x. And so then when I factor out a 2x, I'm left with x minus 20. And then third step in solving a polynomial equation, you set each factor equal to zero and solve to get your solution. So when I set 2x equal to 0, I just get 0. When I set x minus 20 equal to 0, I get positive 20. And so technically, either one of these could be my solutions. However, look at x equals 0. If I plug 0 in for x, 2 times 0 is 0. Can you have a length of 0? No. Same thing here. 6 times x is 0. You can't have a length of 0. So x equals 20 is really only our valid solution because if I substitute 20 in, I get my real answers because lengths have to be positive. Let's try another two. So again, if I set up, oh, so this one's a little bit of a different case solely because 
When you are given a problem with these parallel lines and you're broken up into sections, here's the deal. If one of the sections is marked congruent, well, then that means that 2a, whatever that is, must be equal to 4a minus 1. And if that portion is congruent to each other, well, then that's going to, by default, mean that this segment is congruent to this segment. And we didn't have that in the previous two problems. So once one of the segments is marked congruent to another segment, then by default, the other two segments are going to be marked congruent. And so you really are just setting them equal to each other and solving. Whereas this last one, I don't see anything marked up but I am going to set up a proportion. So I'm going to say x plus 2 over 3x is equal to x, uh, 4 over x plus 4. Now cross products here. So remember, when you do x plus 2 times x plus 4, let me write this out. So when I use my cross products here, okay, and I'm going to do x plus 2, times x plus 4. Remember, x times x is x squared. x times 4 is 4x. 2 times x is 2x. And 2 times 4 is 8. So when I multiply those across, I get that as a result. And then combining like terms, of course, 4x plus 2x is 6x. And then 3x times 4 is 12x. And now again, we have a polynomial equation. And we know we have a polynomial equation because we have a variable um, with an exponent greater than 1. First step in solving a polynomial equation, set the equation equal to 0. So we would subtract 12x. Step 3, factor. So now this is a trinomial. Remember, when you go to factor a trinomial in this form where the a value is 1, you look at your value of c, you determine what factor pair of c is going to give you a sum of b. So clearly a 1 and an 8 is not going to give you a negative 6, but 2 and 4, I can totally get a negative 6. If they're both negative, if 2 and 4 are both negative, they will add up to get negative 6 and they will multiply to get 8. So my factored form is x minus 2 x minus 4. Remember, negative 2 and negative 4 have to add up to get negative 6, and they have to multiply to get positive 8. Then when I set them each equal to 0, x minus 2 gets set equal to 0, I get x equals positive 2. If x minus 4 gets set equal to 0, I get positive 4. And in this case, we actually do have two solutions for x. Okay, so now I set up some problems with just more factoring practice, and you might find that you need some more factoring practice. So if you want to look at this screen, multiply it out and see what you're left with, please go ahead and do that. Maybe pause, otherwise just follow along with me. So using cross products here, if I was to multiply, so this then becomes x squared. So x times x is x squared, x times one is x, and then five times two x is 10 x. I have a polynomial equation, step one, set it equal to zero. So I'm going to subtract 10x. Always check to see, do you have a GCF? I do definitely have a GCF of x squared and negative 9x. It is positive x. So if I factor out an x, I'm left with x times x minus 9. If I set this factor equal to zero, I get zero as a result. If I set x minus 9 equal to zero, I get 9. And um, you always want to check to see if you have any of those um, extraneous solutions. Um, if I plug in a zero, you want to check, like, does this make sense? So if I plug in a zero, that's one. Five over one is five. But if I plug in a zero here, zero over zero is zero. This actually just does not give you a true statement when you plug it back in. But check out nine. If I substitute a nine in, nine plus one is ten. Five over ten is half. And if I plug the 9 in here, that becomes 9 over 18, and which is also a half. So 9 works. 0 just did not work. Okay, so now this one. So remember, if you do x plus 3 times x minus 8, you get x squared minus 8x plus 3x minus 24. 
which then becomes x squared minus 5x minus 24. And then 3 times negative 10 is negative 30. Step 1 in solving a polynomial equation, set the equation equal to 0. So I would add 30. Now I have a trinomial. This can sometimes be a, a tricky trinomial because when you look at the c value of 6, um, factor pairs of 6 are 1 and 6, 2 and 3. And you need to get a negative 5 out of them. But they, the numbers have to add up to get negative 5, but multiply to get a positive 6. So if I try out 1 and 6, to get them to multiply to get positive 6, they either have to both be positive or both be negative. If they're both positive, they'll multiply to get 6, but they'll add up to get 7. If they're both negative, they'll add up to get negative 7, and they'll, but they'll multiply to get positive 6. It just doesn't work. So then you try 2 and 3. If 2 and 3 are both positive, they'll multiply to get 6, but they'll add up to get positive 5. But if they're both negative, they'll add up to get negative 5 and still multiply to get positive 6. So I need a negative 2 and a negative 3. So x minus 2, x minus 3. And then if I set them equal to 0, I get an x value of 2 and an x value of 3. Okay. Next one, if I do cross products, so 2x times x is 2x squared. 3 times x plus 2 would be 3x plus 6. Set this equal to 0. So I'm going to subtract the 3x minus 6. And now this is a trinomial where the a value is not 1. It is actually 2. And so we can't just do the process we did previously in factoring. Um, I could do my ac method here, and I can say, okay, well, 2 times negative 6 is negative 12. Factor pairs of 12 are 1 and 12, 2 and 6, 3 and 4. I have to figure out which factor pair is still going to add up to get me a negative 3, but I'm going to know this pretty quickly. None of that is going to happen, which means that I can't factor this trinomial with nice integers, but I do have a process that we did learn in Algebra 1 as well, along with factoring, is I could technically use the quadratic formula in order to find my solutions. So I do see that my a value is 2, my b value is negative 3. I've got a little light here. So 2, negative 3, and negative 6. And so remember your quadratic formula. It's x equals negative b. So I'm going to do negative negative 3 plus or minus the square root of b squared, so negative 3 squared, minus 4ac, all over 2a, and a is 2. All right, so it's x equals negative b, so negative negative 3, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, all over 2 times a. So now negative negative 3 becomes 3, plus or minus Negative 3 squared is positive 9. Negative 4 times 2 times negative 6 is positive 48. 2 times 2 is 4. Um, 9 plus 48 is 57. And technically, because 57 is irrational, I could leave it as this answer. Um, I could also, of course, do 3 plus the square root of 57, divide it by 4 and get a decimal and then do 3 minus the square root of 57, take that result and divide it by 4 and get my other decimal value. But I'm just going to leave it like this for now. I know there's a lot of information in this video. Thank you so much for watching.